May the 1st, I believe. Uh, a few people who are traveling, a few people who are sick, just bringing greetings from everybody. But you're here today, and so I'm going to preach the Word of God to you today, and I, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. And so uh, we're going to turn there. And Daniel, in fact, I just would you bring that? Would you bring a chair over here for me so I can? And sometimes I like to stand up and I like to preach, and there's other times where I like to, I like to just sit down and I like to teach. I want to just dig into the Word of God. And so today I feel like just sitting and, and taking my time with this and teaching God's Word. Is that all right with you today? All right. We're going to read now. If you don't know already, this week, this coming week. In fact, beginning on Monday night, begins the biblical celebration of Passover. And so in Hebrew, the way that you say that is Pesach. Do you want to try that? And you got to get the, the guttural Isaac in there at the end. It's not Pesach, it's Pesach. Can you, you got to just kind of roll. There you go. I heard talking it over there. Very good. And so, um, and so this a biblical celebration is beginning this week. And so I want to talk about today and I'm going to just help you to understand some of the significance of this biblical feast and how it really helps us to understand who Jesus is and what he did for us all right and so uh, I've got some some, 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 some some items here I'll talk about those later uh, but we're really going to point this and connect this to Jesus today and so we're going to start off by by reading a uh, first Corinthians chapter 5 and just to warm you up a little bit, one of these days, my dream, my goal is I like to get everybody just reading the Bible with me. So one of these days when I get like a wireless microphone or something, I'll call on some people and they'll read the scriptures and then we'll just talk about it together. But for right now, I don't think this cord reaches long enough and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot yet, but we're really going to have some fun with this as we get into it. But I'm going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, it says this, verses 7 and 8, it says... Clean out the old leaven. But everybody say leaven together. Leaven. All right, we're going to talk about what that is. If you're a baker, maybe you know. If you're not a baker, that's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll fill you in. I am not a baker. Uh, so that you may be a new lump, meaning a new lump of bread or a lump of dough, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, now here's the key, right? For Christ, our Passover. Would everybody say together, Christ, our Passover? Christ, our Passover. Or if you want to, you know, put the Hebrew into practice. I hear Lynn doing it. Christ, our Pesach, if you want to say it in Hebrew, has also been sacrificed. And by the way, the word Pesach in Hebrew, it's translated, in my opinion, pretty well. Passover. That's what the word Pesach means. And we'll talk about this in a moment. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I want to ask you, would you pray with me one more time, right where you're, right where you're seated? I, I think just if you, would, if you would make this a good prayer. Now, I'm not saying that some prayers are bad, I'm not, but if you would just make this a, a, a heartfelt, sincere prayer. Father, we're saying we just want you to open up your word to us today. And help us to understand what is written. Would you pray with me today? Maybe just raise a hand towards heaven, just right where you're, where you're seated if you like, and just reach out in the presence of God. God, have your way today. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you, God. We worship you. We give you praise today. Let your words speak to our hearts and communicate to us the beautiful principles that are found in your word. We give you all of the glory and all of the honor. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. I know you're seated already. You can remain seated. And so let me just frame the, the, the context as we begin to talk about Passover and, and what this means, all right? So this goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. If you want to read this for yourself, you can just, if you really want to start, it's the beginning of the book of Exodus to get the context. I think you're going to want to go to at least chapter 12. All right, now you don't have to do that in a single day, but if you want to get the context, 
That's where you're at. You're in the, we're in the book of Exodus. And what happened in the book of Exodus, Tati, I'm not picking on you. I just like to call people's names when I teach. Tati, what happened in the book of Exodus, it's good to see you, by the way, today. What happened in the book of Exodus is that the Bible says that God's people, the children of Israel, had come to settle in the country called Egypt. And they had originally settled in Egypt, and everything was good. The Egyptians loved them. The king of Egypt loved them. Some of the, uh, uh, one particular person by the name of Joseph had actually saved Egypt from a serious famine because God gave him an interpretation of a dream. And so the children of Israel were loved by the Egyptians. And so they came and they settled down in Egypt. But then the Bible says, and this is in the first chapter of Exodus, that there arose a new king that did not know Joseph or God's people. So there was some sort of shift in the spiritual uh, atmosphere of Egypt. Some sort of takeover took place where one dynasty of kings was, was somehow, and historically there's some, I won't get into it historically, but there was probably a, 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 a hostile takeover of the Egyptian uh, uh, pharaoh dynasty that took place during this time. And the new king that came into power did not know Joseph or the children of Israel. And so what they did when they, when they were now in this position of power, and as they came into this position of power, these Egyptians also brought with them the gods that they worshipped and the whole spiritual uh, 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 system, which was anti-God. It was, it was an idolatrous system. It was an evil system. And they brought it with them in power. And so... When they saw the children of Israel, they decided to take advantage of them. And they made them their slaves. And they were living peaceably in the land of Egypt. But, but, but now when this new power comes into, into play, they find themselves that they have, been, uh, they have been almost tricked, if you will. They have, been, they have been taken advantage of. And they have been forced to now become slaves in the land of Egypt. And so in that first chapter of Genesis, it says that, that the Egyptians made God's people, he made their lives bitter with hard labor and bondage. And, and it even got to the point that now the, the Egyptians, as they've enslaved God's people and they're forcing them to, to, to do their bidding, but then there's still a little bit of concern because this people that they've enslaved is, is growing in numbers and they're... They're actually more powerful than they probably realize. So they say, unless they take advantage of us and they rebel against us, let's make sure we put to death every first or every male child from amongst the, these people of Israel. Let's put to death every male unless they get even stronger. So not only do they have them under captivity, not only have they, have they, have they uh, brought them into bondage, into their system as they're serving these false gods and these idols, but now they are even stopping them from growing by trying to put to death their offspring. And so this is what the enemy of our soul desires to do in our life. He desires to steal our future from us. He desires to make our lives bitter with hard bondage. And so the way that he does this is that he, he, he sneaks up on us unsuspectingly. And we're all born into this, this, this Egypt system, if you will. We are all born into the world. And we are all, at some point, we become subject to the thinking of this world and the systems of this world that are governed by the God of this world, the enemy of our soul, the devil, and the, the ruling principalities and powers that have latched on to the systems of this world and want to keep this world in bondage according to its systems. And so we all fall prey at some point. We at, we at some point in our life, maybe from an even early childhood, we learn to think like the world. We learn to follow the desires of our human heart the way that the world teaches us how to do. We learn to pursue the lusts of our eyes and the lusts of our flesh and the pride of our life the way that the world and its sinful system teaches us how to do but what inevitably happens is that just like the children of Israel found themselves enslaved by the Egyptians, so, so, so also we become enslaved 
to the system of this world. And now the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh and the world system that we have taught and absorbed, it becomes a, a force that keeps us in its grasp and we find that we are unable to escape from it. And so sin becomes the ruler in our life. Addiction becomes the ruler in our life. Fear becomes our taskmaster. And we find that we are unable to be free from the power of this world and from the system of this world. And we want to be liberated to worship God and to become the children of God that somewhere inside of our hearts we know we are called to be. But we are unable to escape from the, the power of the slave, the slave traders and the, the taskmasters that are ruling over us. So sin and the system of this world becomes this force of bondage that keeps us in check. So if God were not to intervene, there would be no freedom. There would be no hope because we don't have the power to overthrow the God of this world that's ruling over our life. We don't have the power to overcome the driving force of sin that is like a monster inside of each of us that has grown over the years and, and it has been fed by us following the lusts of our flesh. And it's this monster in our life, Daniel, that we don't know, we don't have the power to properly deal with it unless God intervenes. And so this is what God says that he is going to do that brings about this event called the Passover. He says, I am going to judge Egypt and I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt. And I'm going to, to when, when, when I bring my judgment against Egypt, it's going to have the result that evil is going to be exposed for evil. And it's also going to have the result that my people are going to be allowed to be set free from this body. When I execute my judgment, when I bring my judgment into the world, God says. So Passover is about the judgment of God coming because God is not going to sit idly by forever while his people are in bondage. God is not going to allow the God of this world and the system of this world to keep his people from possessing their inheritance as the children of God. Let me just stop here for a moment, and I want to tell you this in the Spirit. God has an inheritance for you. I want to just pause because I really want someone to receive this today. You have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. I feel this on my spirit so strongly. You are a child of God. I want to say that in the Holy Ghost, and I want you to receive it today. Don't look at the fear that's blinding your eyes. Don't look at the pain that you might be dealing with in your heart. Listen to the voice of God today. God is speaking this over your life. You are a child of God. Even though you might feel like you have been in Egypt for a long time. Even though you feel like you might have been in bondage to an addiction. Or in bondage to a way of thinking. I want you to hear God's voice. He says, I am going to deliver you. Because you are my child. Would you just take a moment and receive that today? Would you take a moment and just receive God's words and say... God, I am a child of God. I believe, I believe your word. I believe your voice that I am your child. And so, so God now is, is, is going to execute his judgment. But there is a problem because how, when God goes to execute judgment, there is a matter of how does God go about judging this situation? It's one thing for God to judge Egypt, okay? But if God is going to judge, God judges justly and fairly. And so how does God execute judgment? And, there, and, and there's, there's this passage in Exodus, I think it's the second chapter of Exodus, that illustrates this problem of how does God execute judgment. Because in, in the book of Exodus, second chapter, the Bible talks about Moses, who God has raised up to be a deliverer. But uh, Moses, at one point, he gets ahead of the plan of God. He decides, I'm going to take matters into my own hand, and I'm going to execute judgment for myself. Now, whenever we take matters into our own hands, that's always a recipe for getting ourselves into trouble, is it not? Whenever we get ahead of God's plan, 
whenever we get a little impatient and say, I'm going to do this in my fleshly mind. Anybody ever been there? And we get ahead of the plan of God. What do we always do? We make a mess of things. Moses, one day, he goes out into the field and he sees an Egyptian that is beating and abusing one of Moses' brothers, an Israelite. He sees an Egyptian slave master beating and abusing. I doesn't tell you the context. Maybe the, 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 the slave was, was tired that day. Maybe he was exhausted, but whatever the case was, he sees the Egyptian that is beating and abusing. And Moses just realizes and says, I, I can't stand this anymore. And in his fleshly mind, he rises up. The Bible says that he strikes down the Egyptian and kills him. And he buries him in the sand. His anger rises up. And he thinks, okay, nobody's, nobody's seen this, this action. It, it, it's hidden. It's done. He moves on. But then the Bible says that just following this event, on a subsequent day, Moses goes out in the field again. And this time, he sees not an Egyptian, but he sees a fellow Israelite that is beating and abusing another fellow Israelite, one of his own brothers. And Moses is confused. How can you, how can you, you're both in this same bondage together. How can you fight with one another? The enemy is the Egyptian. And he sees one of his fellow Israelites rising up and beginning to beat one of his brothers. And so what is this illustrating to us? This is illustrating to us that if God is going to execute judgment, really when it comes down to it, there's nobody that is righteous that can say, I deserve to escape the judgment of God. So how can ju God judge rightly and judge fairly? Is it right for God to just go judge the Egyptians? when God's own people have wickedness in their own house? Is it right for God to judge the Egyptian slave master who is beating a Hebrew, but for God not to go into the house of the Hebrew who is beating his fellow Hebrew? If God is going to execute judgment in the earth, doesn't God have to do it there? And so this is where God steps in. He says, I have a solution. And I'm going to give to you, he says, an, an ordinance. And what this ordinance is going to do is it's not going to make the, the issue of judgment dependent upon, upon your past actions. It's not going to make the judgment issue an issue about what you deserve. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an ordinance to keep, and this ordinance is going to make the issue of judgment, it's going to make it about an issue of faith and obedience to my word. I'm not going to look for who does not, who, who deserves judgment and who doesn't deserve judgment. I'm going to instead look for who is willing to have faith and obey my command. And for those who are willing to obey my command and faith in my word, I am going to pass over them in the day of judgment. And that's where the word pass over to So God says, this is, this is the command, this is the ordinance. He says, to every family, you are to take a lamb that is, number one, without blemish, without any fault, any flaw in it. And you are to take this lamb, and, and, and you are to offer it as a sacrifice on the 14th day of the month. God said, this is going to be like a new month for you. This is going to be the beginning of the year. It's going to be like a new birth for you, is really what he's saying, because if you really look at the Hebrew calendar, there's actually two new years. There's one in the fall, and then there's one in the spring. Long story, I'll talk about that on another day. God is saying, this month is going to be like a new birth for you. It's going to be like a, a new beginning for you. Even though you already have a new year, this is going to be like a new, new year for you. And what you're going to do is you're going to sacrifice this lamb on the 14th day of the month. And you're going to take the blood of the lamb and spread it across the two doorposts and across the lintel of the house. That's like the, the horizontal bar that connects the two doorposts on top of the door frame. Put the blood on the doorpost, on the doorpost, and on the top. And he says that it's going to come to pass that when I go through the land to execute my judgment against Egypt and against the gods of Egypt, 
that whosoever has the blood of the lamb spread across their doorpost, that when I go to execute my judgment, when I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over that house and I will protect them from judgment. Doesn't matter if that person was out in the field fighting last week and beating up their fellow brother. Doesn't matter if they made a bunch of mistakes in times past. If they are willing to hear my words and obey this commandment, this ordinance, and spread the blood of the lamb across their doorpost, then I will pass over and protect them in the day of judgment. And I will bring them out of bondage to Egypt and I will make them to be my people. This is the principle of Passover and what it represents for us in our life. Now, in the book of John, it explains to us very clearly in John chapter 19 that when Jesus was crucified, it says, now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. This is the day when Jesus was crucified. It was the day the annual celebration, just like we're getting ready to begin on Monday night when it starts the celebration of the Passover. This is the day Jesus was crucified. It was the day of the preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out with him, Away, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So then he handed him over to them to be crucified. What is the word of God painting? picture of the word of God is painting. It's letting us know that Jesus now, in the era of the new covenant that you and I are living in, that Jesus has become our Passover lamb. So when you begin to look back over the, 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 the mistakes that you have made in your life, and you say, God, I am not worthy to stand in the day of judgment. But God is saying, no, I have prepared for you a Passover lamb. That, is, that has already been sacrificed on your behalf. And so you don't have to worry about standing on your own righteousness on the day of judgment. All you have to do is be obedient to my word, put your faith in me, follow the plan of salvation that is outlined in the gospel. And everybody who has the blood of this lamb on the doorposts of your house, I'm talking now about the blood of Jesus, when you put the blood of Jesus on your life, when you commit your heart and your life fully to the plan of God that he has set in motion for you, then the judgment of God is going to pass you over because when God sees the blood of the lamb, he doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see your faults. He sees the righteousness of the lamb that was slain on your behalf. And he passes over not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of the blood of the lamb that has been applied to your life. And so this is why the Bible says that when it comes to Jesus, it says that he was tempted just like each of us were. He was tempted for sin just like each of us were, but yet he was without sin. What is the word of God saying? It's saying that he was a lamb with no blemish. So he was able to righteously fulfill all the requirements of the Passover lamb because he had no sin. He had no stain. If he had sin, if he had stains, he would have had to just, his death would have just been only sufficient perhaps to pay for his own sin. But because he was perfectly righteous, he had no debt that he owed that needed to be paid. So instead, his life became a propitiation for our debts. He became the completeness, the shalom, the, the missing element of righteousness for our life because he had nothing lacking in his own life. And so he gave his life to be our Passover sacrifice. And then it says that, that the Passover lamb, one of the other requirements was that not one bone of the lamb could be broken. And this is what we see happening in the word of God. John chapter 19, uh, same chapter here on verses 31 through 30. It says that when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. 
They did not break the legs. And those they used to uh, when they had to hurry up the crucifixion process. They would break the legs of the who was being crucified because then the person would suffocate to death and their death would come about more quickly. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. So one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out of his side. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. What did this Passover sacrifice accomplish for us? Well, on the day when in the, in the Egyptian Passover, in the story of the Exodus, on the day when God went through and he executed his judgment against Egypt and the gods of Egypt, it says that every house where there was not the blood of the lamb that had been applied, that God took the life of every firstborn child that was in that house. And so when the Egyptians, and this was, by the way, this was part of the Egyptian idolatrous worship system. They, their, their god at that time, the, the name of the god was Ra. And, and, and in their thinking, in their theology, Ra had a, had a, had a son. This is, this is not biblical theology. This is just messed up uh, worldly theology. And Ra had a son by the name of Horus. And so what they actually believed was that, was that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was the physical manifestation of Horus in the earth. And they also believed that every subsequent firstborn child in the, in the royal family had to be an unbroken line of succession so that Horus always had a representative in the earth. And this is the, the Egyptian system, the idolatrous system that, that has the children of Israel in bondage. So God says, I'm going to break this curse. I'm going to break and I'm going to, to, to destroy the gods of Egypt. And every firstborn child is going to die. And that they are going to realize that this, 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 this system is not of God. And by so doing, I am going to also purchase freedom for my people. And so when the, when the children of Israel woke up after God had went through and executed judgment in the land of Egypt, they walked away from the land of Egypt that day, completely freed from their bondage because the Passover lamb had been sacrificed and God's judgment had set them free. Can I tell you today that if the blood of Jesus is applied to, to your life, you are free. The Word of God says that whom the Son sets free is free indeed saints of god can i tell you today that there is no addiction that has the power to keep you in its bondage there is no force of depression there is no mental obstacle there is no spiritual obstacle that has the authority or the right to keep you in bondage because jesus has made you free by his sacrifice whom the son sets free is free indeed. Would you just give the Lord some praise for that today? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I want to declare to you today, church, you are free in Christ. You are free. God has already paid the price. God has already judged the God of this world. He has already judged the system of this world. And he has already issued the decree by his blood that you are free in him. Thank you, Jesus. Now, let me, let me, let me just uh, go over how this Passover meal was celebrated. And I have these here today. And there are, there are two elements that we're going to talk about the first actually there's three there's three elements that have to do with what the bible calls the passover meal and the first element was that they would sacrifice and they would eat the lamb that they would put the blood on the doorpost. now we don't need to do that because christ is our passover so we don't need to go out and kill a lamb because christ is the lamb he's already fulfilled that that's already done now, there was two elements that they were also instructed to keep during this Feast of Passover. The first element, and I'll have this with me, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to have these with me here uh, as we fellowship in the back. 
if anybody wants to just just try it and, and, and see what it's like. So the first element the Bible says is that they were to eat bitter herbs. And so I have some bitter herbs here. By the way, most herbs are bitter. So it wasn't a specified, you know, this is, if, that's why you don't just eat salad. You put a little dressing on it, right? Because the dressing, com, you know, contrasts. But if you just eat those salad or those lettuce, it's what? It's bitter, right? So parsley, I have some parsley here. And this is, this falls under the classification of bitter herbs. And so they were to celebrate the meal of Passover by eating bitter herbs. Now, why was this, Tati? The reason why is because when they celebrated this Passover meal, they were supposed to remember what God had delivered them from. And the Bible says that, that the, the children of Israel, the Egyptians, made their lives bitter with hard bondage. And so when you eat these bitter herbs, you're reminding yourself, man, God delivered me from a whole lot of mess. And so, and so what that does, what that does for you is it reminds you, I'm never going back. No matter how tough life may get, no matter how difficult at times it might seem like, even my walk with God might get. But anything is better than Egypt. I'm not going to go back to the bondage that I used to have. I'm not going to go back to just following my own desires and living according to the lust of my own flesh. I'm not going to allow this world system to bring me back into bondage. And so that's what the bitter herbs represent. And so if you choose to just grab a piece of that today when we eat, and you, I don't have a lot, but if you choose to take a little piece off of it, let it remind you. Let it remind you about the things that you've been through in your past. Let it remind you about what God has delivered you from, but let it also make you rejoice. I'm not in that bitter bondage anymore. God set me free from it, and so now I am his child, and thank God that he delivered me from the bitterness of Egypt. Now, the next thing that they were to do when they celebrate, and I have this here, is they were supposed to eat what the Bible calls unleavened bread. Does anybody like to bake? Any bakers in the house today? And that's a great baker. She's a good cook and a good baker. So I, I, I don't fully understand this because I don't bake. But the way that bread works is you have to introduce, if you want it to rise, become a loaf, you've got to introduce something called yeast to it. Or in the Bible, it's called leaven. And so leaven is like this chemical agent that you introduce into the dough that causes the dough to rise while it's proving or while it's baking or Whatever dough does. I told you I don't know how to cook, right? So I'm really showing it right here. And so, uh, and, and, and the way that they would do this back in these days is that, is that they would take some of the leaven and they would introduce it into the dough and it would rise. And then every subsequent batch, they would save some of that leaven, some of that yeast that they used for the baking process. They would save some of it from that batch and they would use it for subsequent batches of dough. And so it would go on and on. The leaven would be then used over and over and over. And, and, and they would take pieces off of it. And, and, and that, that mixture would constantly stay in the house. So what leaven represented over time was that it was a connection to your past. Because it was the same leaven that you would use last Saturday, last Shabbat, when you were breaking the bread. And, and you're, you're, you're baking this bread. And it, was, it was the leaven that had been in the house from... You know, for, for days and weeks and months, it was a link to your past identity. And so when God is getting ready to deliver the children of Israel, he says, I want you to go through your house and remove all of the leaven. Because he says, I'm going to take you out of Egypt and I'm going to make you a new creation. And so your job is to get rid of all of your ties to the past. All the things that you used to do before God delivered you. All of the ungodly, uh, perhaps, entertainment that you used to indulge in. All, anything that you would allow into your spirit or the idols that you used to worship. Or even the broken religious systems, maybe that you used to be a part of. The idolatry that you used to partake in. The, the, the broken mindsets, the, the habits, the addictions. He says, I want you to go through your house and take everything out that is a connection to your past identity. 
Now this goes against what we like to do as humans. We like to hold on to our past. We, we, we have this habit of getting sentimentally attached to things that God says, no, I want to deliver you from that thing. And so part of the celebration of this Passover is that as we get ready to, to embrace the new identity that God has given us, we are to go through our house and we are to find all the old leaven and we're to purge our house from it. And that's signifying that God is breaking us from our past. God is breaking us from our bondage in Egypt. God is delivering us from our old identity. And he is making in us a new creation. So that's why when you celebrate the Passover, we eat it with unleavened bread. It's to remind us that at this time of year and really constantly throughout our life, we are to purge our house of the old leaven. We are to purge our house of everything in our life that is a tie to our old identity so that we can allow God to make in us a new creation.